Like she said, my name is Sherry Crabtree. I'm a horticulture research and extension associate at Kentucky State University. And we're going to be talking today about pawpaws. I'll go ahead and um, get my screen up with my PowerPoint presentation. So we're gonna talk just all about pawpaws. And um, like Sharon said at KSU, we're actually the only um, full-time pawpaw research program in the world. So a lot of, there's some other universities that do some research with pawpaw, but we're the only place that has a, a program devoted completely to pawpaws. So glad everyone could be here. Oops. So if you are not familiar with pawpaws, just kind of what is a pawpaw? And um, the scientific name is a semina triloba and it is in the custard apple family, which is interesting because the rest of that family are all um, tropical and subtropical fruits. Pawpaw is the only temperate member of that family, the only one that can grow here where we get um, you know, freezing, below freezing temperatures, but it still retains kind of that tropical appearance to the tree and tropical flavor to the fruit. So it's a, a fairly slow growing, small to medium sized tree. And the fruit are in clusters, um, like you see, usually two to five, five fruit per cluster. You do see some single fruits and some that have more, more than that. And for improved varieties, um, usually the average fruit size is around a half a pound up to a pound in size. So it's almost kind of a mango um, appearance, you know, size and shape to the fruit also. I mean, if you haven't tasted pawpaw fruit before, it has this unique tropical flavor and aroma. Um, the best description is a blend of mango and banana, but there's different undertones, um, pineapple, coconut, um, kind of vanilla, custard, caramel, different flavors like that, that you get with different varieties. Um, the flesh is really soft and creamy, kind of like a ripe avocado texture wise. Um, it's also really nutritious, high in a lot of vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants. So kind of starting at the beginning of the year, um, when do pawpaws flower? So April and May in Kentucky, it's usually right after um, dogwoods, red buds, dogwoods, and then pawpaws coming in right about the same time or right after dogwoods. And a lot of people um, ask about having a male and a female tree. Um, there are male and female parts. There aren't separate male and female trees with pawpaw. There's male and female parts on the same tree in the same flower, but you do need two trees for cross-pollinating. Um, not because they're separate male and female, but just because they're not self-fertile. Although we recently had a graduate student do a project looking at self-pollination because sometimes you hear about people that have only one pawpaw tree in their yard, nothing else anywhere around. And they ask, um, you know, they say, oh, I had some fruit on my tree. How did this happen? Um, so we found that they will set a few fruit through self-pollination. So sometimes if you have a single tree, you'll get a few fruit. But if you really want a full crop or a lot of fruit, you do need two trees to cross-pollinate. Another unique thing about pawpaws is they're pollinated by flies and beetles instead of by bees. Pawpaw is nice in edible landscape. Um, you know, it's a nice looking tree, has this really pretty golden yellow fall color, these maroon colored flowers in the spring. And it also attracts the zebra swallowtail butterfly. Actually, pawpaw is the exclusive host plant for zebra swallowtail larva. It's the only plant that, that the larva of that butterfly feed on. So a lot of people at plants, um, butterfly gardens will plant pawpaw trees in order to attract this butterfly. And if you see these butterflies around, you know there's pawpaws somewhere nearby. So on this map, you can see um, on the left, the native range of pawpaw. This is where they're found in the wild. In Kentucky, we're right in the middle of the native range, so they do well here. And the map on the right shows where they can be grown, basically all of the temperate regions of the US. Um, they're hardy to about 25 below Fahrenheit. So anywhere except, you know, North Dakota, Minnesota, you know, places like that, it gets too cold um, for pawpaw. So they cannot be grown there. They do need some chill hours in the winter time, which we actually have another graduate student working on that, probably around 400 chill hours. So that means that places that it doesn't really get cold in the winter, like South Florida, 
Hawaii, the very southernmost Texas, California, places like that, they don't get enough cold temperatures in the winter for pawpaw. So USDA zones five to nine here in Kentucky, we're in zone six. Pawpaws do grow in the wild. They're a native plant here. They're usually in the understory of hardwood forests. A lot of times they're along rivers and creeks and areas like that. And they form these big patches um, that are all shoots, they're all root suckers, all basically shoots from one root system. And a lot of times you don't find a lot of fruit in the wild patches. And that's one of the reasons why, remember they have to cross pollinate to set a lot of fruit. And if all of the plants, it looks, may look like hundreds of plants in this pawpaw patch, but if they're all from one root system, they're all the same, they're all identical genetically. So they can't cross pollinate to set fruit. Um, there's a few other reasons, um, even though, so in the wild, they're found in the shade. A lot of people think they have to grow in the shade and they can grow in the shade, but they produce more fruit in full sun. So being in these shady environments that they're in, in the wild, they will produce fewer fruit being in the shade also. Um, there also may just not be enough pollinators around. But if you do have a wild patch, there are some ways that you can maximize fruit production in the wild patches. Um, you wanna thin it out, you know, kind of select the strongest, healthiest looking trees that are about eight feet or so apart. And also anything that you can do to let more light in, um, you know, pruning out trees that are shading them or even clearing out trees around them that are shading the trees to get more light in. And also clearing out any other underbrush that's competing with pawpaws. A lot of times you find bush honeysuckle that's an invasive species in the same habitat as pawpaw. So clear out things like that. Um, also bringing in um, different plants to in increase diversity and have something to cross pollinate. So you can plant feeds or plant seedlings in with your wild pawpaw patch. Um, they'll have something to cross pollinate with. And you can also graft trees. So either plant grafted trees or you can graft trees, uh, you know, collect wood from a different tree that you wanna propagate and graft onto the wild trees in your wild patches. And um, we'll also both improve fruit quality and bring in um, something different to cross pollinate with. A lot of people want to dig and transplant the root suckers. That's difficult to do. You um, you can do it. You can try it the best way because um, they're kind of they don't have a lot of root system of their own. They're kind of connected to the mother tree by like a runner almost since it's root suckers. So you can cut around the root sucker with a shovel, and um, that kind of severs that runner root, but leave it there for another year, and it will. Um, produce a little bit more of its own roots during that year. And then the following spring, dig and transplant it. So that's the best chance of success in digging these uh, root suckers. So if you want to plant your own tree, um, whether it's in an orchard or just in your yard, there's a few things you wanna look for. Um, you wanna avoid the most, the lowest lying areas. Um, cold air is denser or heavier. So cold air accumulates in low-lying areas and they're more prone to damage from frost and freeze. So choose an area kind of higher in your yard, higher on your property. Uh, pawpaws like a soil slightly acid to neutral um, that has a lot of organic matter, ideally, um, that's moist but well-drained. You don't want it to be somewhere that is, you know, boggy or has a lot of standing water, um, but does have, have good moisture. The most important things, pawpaws are fairly low maintenance. Um, weed control, they don't compete well with having a lot of weeds and grass and things growing around, especially young seedlings. So if you just have a couple of trees in your yard, you can just, you know, hand weed, mulch around the trees, helps keep weeds down and conserves moisture in the soil. Um, also wanna make sure they stay well watered. So especially the first couple of years when they're getting established, they need to stay, you know, fairly consistently moist, at least an inch of rain of, um, per week. So if we're in a dry period like we're in now, they definitely need to be watered a couple of times a week. And ideally, you want to test your soil before planting. Um, your county extension agent can help you with that. 
collecting soil samples and sending them in for analysis to see if you're deficient in anything and what you need to do um, if you need to amend the soil before planting. They don't have, um, you have to check a crop on the, the soil test. Um, so pawpaw can basically be treated like apple if you have to choose a crop to compare it to. Um, you can just select apple because the, the needs for nutrients are, are pretty much the same with pawpaw. And we can take a look, you could send it to me and I can take a look and, and see, see how your soil test looks also. Um, again, if you're, when you're planting trees, um, they will produce fruit in shade or part shade. So if you have a shady or semi-shady spot, um, they will grow there, but you just get highest yields in full sun. And pawpaw trees can tolerate full sun once they're over a foot and a half tall. So that's one caveat. If you get a seedling that's really small, they do need to be protected from the sun until they're at least a foot and a half tall. Um, planting distance, we recommend eight to 10 feet between trees. And spring planting has traditionally been recommended for pawpaw. We're actually doing a little experiment looking at planting in the fall versus in the spring. And so far, actually, we had really good survival from the fall planting. So we may amend that right now. It seems like fall or spring, either one works for pawpaw. But in the past, we've always recommended spring. They do like some nitrogen. Uh, they're not really picky about what source it is. So um, we use urea. You can use, you know, miracle Grow or Peters or one of those water-soluble fertilizers composted manure, fish emulsion, really anything that has, um, has some nitrogen in it. So to maintain trees, um, pawpaws naturally have kind of a bushy growth habit. So the, the top photo on the right, you see a tree that's basically unpruned. So that's how they'll look. If you don't prune them, they'll get a lot of low branches and kind of bushy. The tree on the left in that top photo we prune more like an apple tree to a central leader, um, choosing the strongest lateral branches and um, removing the limbs that are growing too, um, too close to the ground. Um, we did kind of a trial with this and it's kind of your preference. There were some pros and cons to both. Um, pruning them like an apple tree, they're stronger trees. You don't get as many broken limbs, things like that. It's certainly easier to pick from. You can just see the fruit better and reach it better. And we thought we might see some sunburn on the fruit, opening it up like that, but that wasn't a problem. They were a little bit slower to start producing fruit. More of the unpruned trees produced fruit earlier, you know, in just three years or so, and had slightly lower yields, really just simply because you're removing some of the branches that could be producing fruit. And it's a little bit more labor pruning, you know, some people just want to plant something and forget it. So um, really, it's, it's your preference. You can also mow and weed eat a lot easier under the trees that are pruned. So they don't require a lot of pruning like an apple tree or peach tree. Um, I'll say that, but they can be pruned similar to an apple tree. And one thing that we have found in the orchards or in full sun, they will get um, sun salt or southwest injury on the trunks that causes the trunk to crack. And so we now recommend if they're in the sun to paint the trunks white. This is just 50-50 white latex paint mixed with water. And what that does, um, how the sun scald happens is in the winter time, the tree's dormant, but the sunshine's strongest on the Southwest side of the tree and the bark being darker absorbs the heat and warms up and the sap starts flowing, then it gets cold again. And it's kind of like a freeze thaw cycle and causes cracking. So that white paint reflects the sunlight and keeps the temperatures from fluctuating so much. And we think, so if the limbs were going farther to the ground, it would not be as much of a problem. So that's another slight drawback to pruning them like an apple tree, or if they were in the shade, they would be protected more from the sunlight. So that's probably why they're a little bit more prone to that than some trees. Pawpaws, like I mentioned, they're pretty low maintenance. They don't have nearly as many disease and insect problems as apple trees and peach trees and things like that. There are a few things that we see. This is the main disease that we see. Um, Phyllosticta is the name of it. It's, it's a fungal spot. So it's these black spots on the leaves and on the fruit. Uh, usually it's just a cosmetic thing. So the fruit and the bottom center 
if you cut into that fruit, it would be fine on the inside. It's just spots on the skin. It doesn't cause a rot or anything like that. But when you get really bad cases of it and a big portion of the fruit is covered in it, it makes the skin kind of brittle. And as the fruit grows, it can cause cracking. And so if you get really bad cases of it, it can look like the fruit on the right where you see a lot of cracking in the area where that is. So we have looked at using um, sulfur and copper to control it and not had a lot of success. Um, we did look at mancocide, that's a combination of mancozeb, that's a fungicide, and copper that last year um, did pretty well at controlling this, but we also see some cultivars are more resistant than others. Um, the trial, the main trial that we looked at was just sunflower and Susquehanna is kind of a preliminary trial. And Susquehanna had less fruit spot than sunflower. Sunflower was more susceptible to it. So we'll do, we do breeding, um, try and develop new improved varieties at KSU. So that is one thing that we're breeding for is disease resistance um, to that fungal spot. Not a lot of insects bother pawpaw. Um, so a semina webworm is kind of like a fall webworm. It builds nests at the end of branches. Usually you don't have so many of these that you can't just kind of clip them out, remove them and destroy them. Um, BT would work against them since it's a caterpillar. We don't, we've never seen, we've never had that at our orchards, but there is a grower we work with in Eastern Kentucky that has a lot of woods close to his orchard. And he has this more frequently. Um, Papa peduncle borer is another little moth larva that the name comes from. The peduncle is the stem that attaches the flower or the fruit to the tree. So it would bore into that and make the flower shrivel up and drop off. But we have seen it apparently likes all parts of Papa because it will um, bore into the small twigs, not into the trunk, but just into little twigs and into the fruit. Um, and you'll see like this fruit, you see some frass, the brown um, powdery stuff coming out of the fruit. That means there's a caterpillar inside the fruit. So generally you don't see a lot of these. We've collected data on it and it was in three to 5% of the fruit. So that's not really a number that you're gonna worry about spraying for or anything like that. Um, something we've seen occasionally, again, not often is this pawpaw sphinx moth. It has a big caterpillar, looks kind of like a tomato hornworm or tobacco hornworm, it's related. Japanese beetles will get on pawpaws a little bit, but it's not their preferred food source. They like plums and grapes and blackberries and other things a lot more than pawpaw. So they're generally not a problem. Um, animal pests can be a bigger problem than insect pests, just eating the fruit. So raccoons and possums really love pawpaw fruit, um, groundhogs, other animals like that. So they'll eat fruit when pawpaw fruit are ripe, they fall on the ground, they will eat that fruit. If they don't have a lot of food around, they will climb up in trees and get fruit. There's not a lot of good ways. It's really just kind of beating the animals to the fruit, going out and, and picking them as soon as they're starting to get ripe to beat them to it. Deer um, do not love pawpaws. They will eat on them if there's not anything else around, but it's not one of their preferred food sources. Um, electric fencing will keep deer out. They do like to rub their antlers on the trees. I don't know why pawpaw more than other trees, but it does kind of seem like they like to rub on pawpaws more than other things. But so for that, we will sometimes put electric fencing around small orchards. They really only do that to small trees. I don't think they like to rub on big diameter trees. I think it's kind of the, um, you know, like one to two inch diameter trees they like to rub on. So if you want to grow your own pawpaws, you can start them yourself from seed. Um, there are some things that you need to do um, to go about that process. The seed requires um, cold, moist stratification, which means it needs to stay in the refrigerator for at least 100 days. So um, about three and a half months or so in the refrigerator. And you don't wanna let the seed dry out. So it needs to be stored in something to keep it damp. We usually put it in damp peat moss in plastic bags in the refrigerator for again, at least a hundred days, but if you need to keep it longer than that, they're viable for really two years until germination starts to go down. You don't wanna store them in the freezer. Um, if you store them in a freezer, that will kill the seed. 
Um, so store them in the refrigerator, keep them damp. You can plant them in pots or you can plant them directly in the ground outside. If you start them in pots, um, pawpaws do have a deep tap root. So you wanna use a deep, tall pot to start them in. So some things about seeds, they're not um, true to type from seed. They're not identical to the parent. So if you have a fruit and it was a really good fruit and you wanna save seed from it, it's gonna be a mix of the two parents. So it will have some qualities of, of the fruit that you collected it from, but it's a mixture of, of the two parents of the tree, the mother tree you got the fruit from and the male parent that um, pollinated it. So sometimes seedlings can be poor quality. You just don't know what you're gonna get basically with seedlings. If they're collected from wild trees that don't have great fruit, they're probably not gonna have great fruit on the seedlings either. But if you collect seeds from um, good varieties that have good fruit, then they're likely to have good fruit also, although not identical to the mother tree. They do take a while to produce fruit from seed, take seven to eight years from the time you plant the seed to the time it's big enough to be producing fruit. So to propagate um, named varieties true to type, since they're not true to type from seed, we graft, which is um, the same thing that's done with apple trees, um, peach trees, most fruit trees are all grafted. You can do this with pawpaw in pots and containers in the greenhouse or, or in south, or in the field, you can graft um, trees that you already have growing outside. Most grafting methods um, work fine. Tea budding is the only method that does not work well with pawpaw. Um, chip budding and whip and tongue are the methods we use the most often. Or you see these grafting tools that you just put it on the plant, squeeze it, it makes kind of a V-shaped cut. Um, that works well with pawpaw too. And it's easy if you haven't grafted trees before, that's kind of an easy way to do it because you don't have to use a knife and, and make the cut yourself. You can graft larger diameter trees. Uh, most of these other methods are best on smaller, like about a pencil diameter tree. And you graft onto pawpaw seedlings. You can't graft pawpaw onto an apple tree or peach tree or something that's not, um, not the same as. So onto pawpaw seedling. And you can do this, like I said, on bigger trees outside. If you've got wild trees, you can cut them down and graft them using what's called bark inlay, where you do like a flap on the side and um, stick a piece of cyanwood into that flap and wrap it up. And we have a video about that um, that goes into more detail, but that will work on bigger, you know, about like three inch diameter trees. So another advantage um, besides the main reason that we graft is to propagate things true to type. So if you have a certain variety of pawpaw you wanna propagate and you want that identical fruit, that identical variety, you need to graft it. But they also take a shorter time to produce fruit. Grafted trees take three to four years to fruit as opposed to seedlings that take seven or eight years. So some varieties, um, pawpaw cultivars that we recommend for Kentucky. And just to take a step back, a lot of people I think don't realize that there are improved varieties or cultivars of pawpaw. They, you know, if you're more familiar with the wild ones, um, and think, you know, a pawpaw is a pawpaw, but there are just like there's honey crisp apples and gala apples, there are cultivars um, that are named and selected from pawpaw also. And KSU, we have a breeding program. So we've released three cultivars so far that were developed here and tested here. So we know they do well in Kentucky. KSU Atwood was our first cultivar that we released. Um, it has kind of a mango flavor to it. It ripens a little bit later in the pawpaw season. So about mid-September is when this ripens in Kentucky. It's high yielding, very productive. KSU Benson is the second variety that we released. One unique thing about Benson, it has this really round kind of baseball or softball shaped fruit. Also high yielding. It's early ripening. So this starts ripening for us in late August. And KSU Chappelle was our most recent cultivar release. It's very vigorous. The tree's vigorous, fast growing, large fruit. It has um, kind of a creamy banana pineapple flavor to it, low percent seed. And it's kind of in between Atwood and um, Benson and Atwood. It's about the first week of September is when it ripens here in Kentucky. 
So some other varieties that we've had in trials that do well here, um, NC1, Overlease. Um, one unique thing about Overlease, it has kind of a cantaloupe flavor. Sunflower has a really mild flavor. Um, and some people that haven't eaten a lot of pawpaws tend to like the milder flavored fruit better. Um, Neil Peterson's a pawpaw breeder from West Virginia, and these are some of his varieties that do well in Kentucky. Um, Potomac, that had the largest fruit in our trial. Shenandoah, also kind of a mild flavored pawpaw. Wabash um, has a round fruit, really orange colored flesh. Susquehanna is one that I would recommend for sure too. It has a really good flavor. It produces fewer fruit per tree. If you look at the number of fruit per tree, it tends to not be super high yielding, but has an excellent taste. It's won a lot of taste tests, both that we've had and at the Ohio Pawpaw Festival. So here are some nurseries that sell pawpaw trees in Kentucky. The Kentucky Division of Forestry um, sells seedlings, Peaceful Heritage that's down in Stanford. Um, England's Orchard Nursery, I will say, I think they're not selling trees right now, but they do sell seeds and cyan wood. So harvest a pawpaw, like I said, it happens late August through late September here in this area. There are a few things that you need to watch out for when you harvest the fruit. The skin stays green generally, even when it's ripe. Sometimes they will turn a little bit yellowish, but in general, the skin is mostly green when it's ripe. So you really can tell it um, by a couple of things. By touch, they'll be soft, kind of like a peach when it's ripe, when you touch it. Also, they will drop on the ground when they're ripe. Or if you're hand harvesting, if you just you touch the fruit, give it just kind of a gentle pull, gentle wiggle, it'll fall off in your hand when it's ripe and ready to pick. You can pick fruit when it is just starting to get, um, get ripe. If it's starting to get just a little bit soft, then it will ripen off the tree. If it's completely hard, hard as a rock, then it will not ripen off the tree. So you need to wait until it's at least starting the ripening process. And that will help extend the shelf life because when they're fully ripe, the fruit only lasts uh, two or three days or so. So you can pick them when they're just starting to get soft. You can also store them in the refrigerator at that point for a couple of weeks and that'll slow down the ripening process and then bring them out to ripen completely. But freezing is the best way to store them for a longer time since they have a short shelf life. So to freeze the pawpaw, we, you can freeze the whole fruit, but they just, they take up a lot of room. So it's really easier to um, puree it um, and put in freezer bags to freeze the fruit. You want to avoid anything that's, you know, bruised, overripe, underripe, discolored. Um, the skin, you do not eat the skin um, and it's bitter. So you wanna make sure not to get any pieces of the skin in that. The seed are also not edible. The seed actually have alkaloids in them that can make people sick to their stomach. So you see the seed are big, so you're not gonna accidentally eat a seed, but if you're pureeing the pulp, you don't wanna, if you accidentally got a seed in a blender and blended it up, then that would make you sick to your stomach. So make sure you remove the seeds. So on a small scale, if you don't have a lot of fruit, you're freezing. We've used colanders, so you cut the, half in fruit, cut the fruit in half, scoop out the insides, push it through a colander or squeeze it through a mesh bag and that will remove the seeds. And then you can freeze that also kind of roughly purees it, can put it in freezer bags to freeze. If you've got a few more fruit that you wanna process and freeze, we have used this um, food mill. You do have to modify it a little bit. So that spiral is made to remove grape seeds which are obviously a lot smaller than pawpaw seeds. So you need to cut off the last two spirals. So it's to the point where it's wide enough that pawpaw seeds can pass through. And we use the pumpkin squash green that is the middle size green. So you still have the step of you cut the fruit in half, scoop out the flesh. So you're, or you can peel it. That's just, it's kind of easier to remove the skin by cutting it in half and scooping out. And you feed that through the food mill and that spiral removes the seeds. And you do need to run it through a few times. You can see in the photo, the pulp tends to want to stick to the seeds. So you want to run it through two or three times to get most of that off. So if you're looking to buy pawpaw fruit or if you have fruit that you want to sell, where can you do that? Um, because of the short shelf life, it's not really a big 
nationwide market. You're not going to find pawpaws shipped across the country and sold in Kroger and Meyer and places like that. So generally, uh, local farmers markets, local produce markets, um, you'll find them again September when they're ripe. There are a few places that do mail order sales online. Um, a lot of the fruit in the state, there's there are some commercial pawpaw growers in the state. And most of that besides the farmers markets and local produce markets goes to wineries, breweries, distilleries, and restaurants are some of the main markets. So there are some pawpaw products out there on the market. And probably the most popular of those right now is the, um, the beer, wine, brandy, things like that. Um, so locally, Wildside Winery sells pawpaw wine. Jep the Creed Distillery that's in Wildside is in for sales. Jep the Creed Distillery that's in Shelbyville sells a pawpaw brandy. Um, and there's been several breweries, um, West Six and a few others have done a seasonal pawpaw beer before. You can um, make pawpaw in baked goods, basically anything that calls for banana, you can substitute pawpaw. So banana bread, cake, things like that. Also um, anything creamy since pawpaw has a creamy texture. So like custard and pudding and things like that, it goes well in. And pawpaw so sweet, you think of it being more for desserts, but it also makes a good hot sauce or salsa, like a mango salsa recipe um, or peach salsa, you can substitute pawpaw fruit. My personal favorite is pawpaw ice cream. And this um, is our ice cream recipe. So if you wanna take a picture, I think you'll get the, um, the presentation emailed to you or on the website. This is the ice cream recipe that we use. This makes a gallon. Um, doesn't have any eggs or anything like that in it that you have to have to mess with. Really simple recipe. And you can also just blend pawpaw pulp in with yogurt or in a smoothie, um, things like that. I personally like it better in things like ice cream where it's not cooked. I think the flavor comes out more. Also makes a good pawpaw jam. And this is a recipe that we developed at KSU. Again, pretty simple. We did taste tests looking at spices added and things that were more like apple butter, but what people liked the best was just this really simple recipe that's just, um, you know, pawpaw and then just the sugar and pectin and, and fruit fresh added. So if you're interested in learning more, um, we do have a Facebook page and a website. And I want to tell you about the third Thursday thing. So the third Thursday of September is always our pawpaw day. Um, field day at the KSU farm. So this year, that's September 15th. And that's at KSU's research and demonstration farm, which is in Frankfurt, um, starts at 10 a.m., 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. It's free of charge. Lunch is provided. Don't have to um, pre-register anything. Um, and we'll have presentations, orchard tours. We'll have ice cream. So all the fun stuff like that. So hopefully, if you're interested in pawpaws, you can come to that to learn more. Um, and that's what I've got today. So if anybody has any questions, I would be glad to, uh, glad to answer.